Tara, in conversation with Dr. Uh, Eric uh, Barucha. Our next session is titled As Tribes as Living Bridges. Uh, in this session, we would be discussing about the works and the books of uh, Dr. Eric Barucha, especially one of his books, Living Bridges for Cultures of India. Uh, India, India's natural ecosystems and traditional knowledge are under siege, even in its remotest areas. Dr. Eric Barucha began to study and document this phenomena in his personal research on the country's wilds. As he saw the values of and the lifestyles and beliefs of the indigenous people, he started uh, doing his research work on them and started working on wildlife photography as well. Dr. Barucha's research is juxtaposed with his narratives and images by Mr. Sumat Mool Dr. Eric Barucha is presently the director of Bharti Vidya Peet Institute of Environment and Research, Pune. He is an expert on biodiversity management, land use planning, environment education, forestry, wildlife management, zoo planning and management. He is a well-known wildlife photographer. He has been a member and the executive of conservation institutions as Bombay Natural History Society. Mr. Ajoy Bhattacharya is a retired IFS officer of the 1983 batch from MP Garden. He is engaged as the country head for the Green Highways Program of Ministry of Road Transports and Highways under National Highway Authority of India since December 2015. He is responsible for the Pan-India implementation of the green projects of the NHAI, MORTH, and NHIDACL under Ministry of Road Transports and Highways. I would request Mr. Ajoy Bhattacharya to take over. Should I? Yes. 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 Okay. We are getting the other mic. Huh? Yeah. But until it comes, please use this. Thank you, Minalini. Uh, she has done uh, my job partially. <coughs> wonderful to be with uh, Eric and uh, actually I was just wondering if organizers had any clue of our old association, long association, we have been associated through ecotourism and uh, conservation education long back and surprisingly these uh, the subjects, the themes of his books are also very close to uh, ecotourism and uh, community based ecotourism the culture, the community, the, uh, the traditions, the traditional knowledge and all these things. And it was a surprise to me at this juncture when I am just planning to have a center for community conservation and climate change. So I think his inputs will be very valuable to me along with all of, all of you. Uh, we, have, we have two books uh, to be discussed here of Eric and very heavy books and uh, not only uh, in weight but in depth, in content, in uh, scope, in horizon. So they are very, uh, they cover the uh, extent of to topics and uh, subjects. This uh, one book, uh, Living Bridges, 2016 publication, 305 uh, pages. It deals with communities, tradition, traditional practices, uh, traditional knowledge. And the second book, uh, is 2017 the changing uh, la landscapes so this is the this is the advanced version of living bridges where he has very aptly integrated the communities the traditions the communities with the landscape from micro to macro so the uh, very 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 efficiently integration of the communities uh, these uh, tradition traditions communities with the landscape uh, concept uh, so eric you know uh, his journey he is is from medicine he is a surgeon and then he is an environmentalist and then he is an uh, educationist then he is a social scientist then he is an anthropologist there is a wildlife one, and then is a photographer. So you can imagine the journey. So I, I'll uh, uh, have just one point here, and uh, 
I'll hand over this to uh, Eric for his vast knowledge. And uh, <clears throat> these photographs, you know, these uh, photographs, they have used photographs to speak. They, they, are, they are based on photographs mainly, although both, both the books, and uh, they have made the photographs speak. Initially, uh, the, in 30 years, Suman, black and white, and he has colored them. And he has, uh, both of them have uh, made them made the, uh, these photographs speak. And uh, I'd certainly have few questions later, and uh, I'll request him to uh, proceed further and also elaborate on how from black and white to color uh, the, his, his journey from surgeon to a photographer with, uh, and ultimately culminating uh, to these books. Over to Eric. Thank you very much. <coughs> I think it's a small group. I don't need a mic. Uh, well, uh, uh, firstly, uh, the fact that I'm here is, <coughs> is a sort of accident. I met Rago <coughs> when he was in the ministry and uh, uh, he saw my book, and uh, he remembers my book since then, so <coughs> I'm here because of that. But there's something very special about this book. I was basically a conservation person, and I worked with conservation organizations. Uh, I worked in environment education, conservation education for many, many years. So basically my background came from wildlife. And, uh, uh, there used to be a person called Sumar Kundavkar who was J.R.D. Tata's number two in those days. And we began to meet very frequently, taking wildlife pictures together. And uh, one day my father, who was his uh, clinician, said, Erez Vayant, why don't you see his tribal pictures? And I asked him to show me these. And he said, no, 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 that's an old story. They're, they're all gone now. But after he passed away, his wife presented me with, with <coughs> hundreds of these big black and white images. And uh, she said, if Suman would have liked somebody to do something with his pictures and make a book, it would be you, so you take these pictures. I had these pictures with me for 15 years, and I started feeling very guilty, which uh, made me look for some fights to do it. Don't tell my wife I got very few fights from outside. Uh, but we started doing this uh, work, and uh, my my office staff, my staff at Bharti Vidya and my students were a huge help in what I was trying to do. I went back to more or less the same places that Suman had gone to in the 1970s and 80s, taking pictures of tribal people. And shifting from wildlife conservation, which you talked about, and wildlife photography, to taking pictures of people was a very new thing for me. In fact, it used to be extremely embarrassing. And then I learned a very very nice trick. I would first take pictures of the children and show them the pictures in the back of my camera, and then everybody would loose it up. I think these two books are about my experiences with these people and how wonderful they are. And uh, those of us who don't know them intimately uh, find it very difficult to understand their huge understanding of nature, their connectedness. Uh, they are just an incredible people. And honestly, these three years of, four years really, of working on these two books changed my life. Um, well, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a very interesting story really that uh, one really looks at this and one wonders where all this began. And it's quite incredible that we are sitting here in the place where virtually all this began in our country. If you really look at this today, Vibetka is not far away from where we are sitting today. And uh, that's where this whole thing began on those cave paintings. And today, what you see there is an image of how connected people were to nature. So uh, this is something that it's remarkable that we are sitting here doing this with Vibetka just so close by. Uh, my earlier uh, work came out through, through looking at sacred groves in the Western Ghats. 
and a lot of the linkages, perhaps some of the stories that I might tell you today are from these Western Ghat uh, stories, which are quite incredible actually, in a sense that they really understand what life and, and what the earth is all about. Um, one of the things that emerged from this was this huge diversity of tribal cultures that we have, and not just tribal cultures, but for farming cultures, the pastoral cultures. These were the most interesting things for me, because uh, as I grew up in that area of the Western Ghats in Pune, and on the other side, the plateaus of the Deccan Plateau, I realized how different landscapes are. And this brought me into trying to understand not just the natural landscapes, but the cultural landscapes of India. So what uh, really comes from is something which is very fascinating, which I could express before you see anything there. The first thing that came about was in 1988, two people, uh, W.A. Rogers and H.S. Pawar of Wildlife Institute, created the first maps of biogeography in India. And uh, since I was very close to them and we were very good friends, we realized how important this was. Today we've been able to bring those biography maps into school curricula for the first time. But it took us so many years to do that. But when I started looking at, re-looking at cultures, I realized how incredibly close the biogeographic map matches to the agricultural map of India. Which meant that our people had thought of years ago how to match the best crops to the best climate, geography, land, soil, whatever. And uh, this was the variation. And as I got more and more interested in foragers, I found that the foragers map that we created of all these tribal cultures, you heard only about gold today, but we have 167 tribal cultures. The map of the forest and grazing lands match perfectly with with the tribal cultures. So this was something that came about new and a large number of people who read my books find this very fascinating. So does Pawar Sahib, because he said, at least somebody is Pawar Sahib, you know. Pawar Sahib says, at least you use my map. So this is something which uh, is quite interesting in the book. Uh, if you try to look at uh, how um, we have uh, seen uh, these people, they're in very bad shape across the country. In some areas, even today in Charkar and Odisha, I've seen extreme starvation. I've seen kids with very bad, bad nutrition. And it's sometimes very, very discouraging when you go there and you see these otherwise happy kids who are in such bad health. Uh, education, I've been to schools with one little classroom with one teacher who is hardly ever there, where the sort of third standard kids are talking to the first standard kids. And this is the state of these tribal cultures. No wonder that there's nationalism. So we need to understand what we can do for this. If you go to any national park or sanctuary today, we go to a tiger reserve, and this is something that KK Singh and I worked on very intensively. Those kids have never been in that tiger reserve. They've never seen what it means to look at nature except for their village. And I've had beautiful stories about their villages too. So this is something that I thought was uh, very significantly important as to how are we going to bring these people. And you saw these bone paintings which so often depict the most incredible imagery of wildlife, of birds, of animals. <coughs> What are we going to do to this? And I'll start by telling you one little story. Uh, most of you ladies wear dresses with uh, wildly paintings. And I started looking for the person who still, who first made drew wildly paintings. And here's a guy called Jivya Soma Marche, passed away a few months ago. Jivya was a wonderful guy. I mean, uh, he uh, had a tremendous way of expressing what he was drawing. And this was something that brought me into trying to understand how they look at their own cultures, not how we look at their cultures. And uh, Jivya was terrific. Of course, he was always drunk, which was very nice, uh, because then he was always opened up. And he uh, uh, would welcome me to his home and 
and uh, I would drink tea, he would drink something else. So uh, this uh, was something that I learned from him. And Jivya Soma Mase, incidentally, was an accidental artist. Uh, in Pupul Jaikar's time, there was an exhibition arranged by my uncle, Shakko Chaudhary, in Delhi. And uh, he wanted some artists from the Wadi thing to come and draw. But the artists in those days were only ladies. Because the tradition of Wadi art was to draw it on the paint on the wall when a new bride came home. That was the idea of the Wadi painting. But uh, these ladies wouldn't go, so there was this young guy called Jivya who said, they'll come with me. So he took these ladies and he did these walls there. While he was sitting there, he took some brown paper that was lying around and with the same rice thing, he made the first Vardi paintings. He brought them back and took them to this gallery called Chimold in, in uh, Bombay. And the Chimol guy was an old Parsi fellow with brown glasses. He said, I like that But somebody saw some American walking in, saw these paintings and bought them. And that's how Jivya started doing this artwork. Today, of course, all sorts of people do Jivya's artworks and copies of them. But uh, these Vanis can look at this painting and say, oh, but this is not from Dhanu, this is from Java which means they can so intensely are able to understand very deeply what actually those little pin figures are, figures are. But another story, since we just saw something about Golnath, um, when I got more and more interested in trying to understand how tribals depict their landscape, I saw a couple of Golnath paintings, and actually in Gopal. And I said, oh, who did this one? And they said, no, no, he's one young fellow who does this. So I said, what is his name? So his name turned out to be Sunil Shyam Hoon. So I keep asking, I want to see this youngster. And uh, But I went, I was traveling through the whole of, whole of the Darbada based at Abdu Amar Karta. And somewhere, you know, very downtrodden MP uh, tourist guest house. <laughs> was a big half done painting on the wall. And I said, that looks gone. So he said, I said, who is it? No, he made it, he made it, he made it, he made it, his name is Sunil Samgod. So I said, where is it? So he said, he made it in our gods. So I went there and I woke up this youngster and I said, can you give me some paintings? He said, I have got some paintings, you know, you can take whatever you want. And so I asked him, I said, Sunil, have you ever taught this kind of painting to young students? And uh, he said, Nay, sir, I thought, sir, it's correct. I think we didn't hear. Now, I knew that the bones of Madhya Pradesh still have few families who do this kind of work. But the bones in Maharashtra have forgotten that they had this artwork for two generations. So I asked Sunil to come there. I got a few gold boys from Gondia, from Gacharoli. I got a few Katkari boys from my village in Madhya Pradesh, in Maharashtra, and we got some mixed school kids. And the first day when Sunil came there, I said, uh, Sunil, it would Sikhana, I So, and I said uh, to the kids, I said, Sunil, sir, you have to learn how to paint. And I found Sunil sitting like this. So I said, Sunil, what happened? He said, no, sir, I have a sir, so I have a sir. Now, this is the humility which you also saw on that screen today. Uh, I mean, that, that humility is, is really remarkable. And then the same sort of story happened. My people brought them large boxes of whatever, 12, 14, 20 colors. And he said, no, sir, we are not going to do this. उनको चार कलर चाहिए मैं उनको मिक्स कैसा करके पिगमेंट बनाना हो मैं सिखा दूँ। The paintings those kids produced in those four day of workshop are worth preserving today because that's what culture means. And there was one painting done by a very small kid, not a god, who has drawn a circle with half moon and half sun. And I said, why do you did, did this? And he said, no, Sunil said, you just imagine something, don't draw what you see. 
So these people have an inherent way of doing these things. Uh, perhaps I could tell you a few stories with that thing about words. This is right. So uh, these are my two books. Living bridges really means the way these cultures are a bridge from our, from our past to our present and perhaps the way we need to go in future. Because there are many things which they will do which uh, are quite remarkable next week. Uh, this is my friend Sumant. Uh, Sumant was an enormous visionary. He, uh, we and I, he and I did a lot of photography together. But uh, what he did was eco restoration, when the word did not exist. And he built a lake for Telco. And people asked, uh, "You're supposed to build uh, trucks and heavy machinery. Why are you building a lake?" And he said, "One day there will be no water for this industry." And this lake will make this industry survive, which is exactly what has happened today in Pipiti Chetchon. Next, please. So, most of the pictures you will see are pictures of then and now. This is a bone lady that uh, Suman took in the 1970s. And that's my visit to a little village called Jaluki, uh, where uh, uh, there were incredible number of uh, young people who danced and who actually brought about uh, a feeling of togetherness. And I've gone there for awarding um, sort of recognition to these Nagaland villages for their community conserved areas. And Chaluki was an exceptional area. And I'll never forget what this gentleman who presented me with a, with a Nagaland quote saying, now you're part of our, our, our community. And uh, he said, Sir, it's not important that you give us a prize. It's important that you came to recognize our community concerned area. So this is their deep feeling that they have for their own forest. And this is a hunter, hunter tribe. These are Zillian tribes who a few years back didn't even leave one bird alive in the forest. Next. So this is your Bimbeka artwork which is there. Very interestingly, the type of work that was done on those cave walls is very similar to Wadli work in, in the west and, and to Saura work in the east. Built thousand, hundreds of miles uh, different from each other and a thousand, uh, several thousand years ago. Next please. Very often we think of this whole thing of tribal and non-tribal cultures. But there have been enormous linkages between these two cultures. Uh, for example, this is, a, this is the tribal raja of Pipri, a tiny small village in the dark forest. And years ago in 1980s when I first met him, he uh, was explaining what his great grandfather had done. So he had a memory of several generations. And he said that to ask a Maharaja and I was with the Maharaja of Vansda in the forest. He said, my grandfather, great grandfather, has anointed your grandfather with his own blood. Now, see, this is how remarkable these kind of things were. There was so much trust between them. And there was so much independence as well. It was a very unique system that was there in this tribal, non-tribal cultures. Thanks, please. Uh, many years ago when I was in medical college, I thought I must go and see UP and so on and so forth. So in those days you traveled by bus and third class train. And I landed up in this small Naga, uh, in this small Toda village. And uh, there was an old lady sitting by her hut, so I photographed her in 1980. Recently when I was doing this work on cultures, I started to think I should go back to the Todas. And uh, when I went there, I took a photograph, I took a print of that first picture. And I showed it around in the Toda village. And one lady said, I think this is the grandmother of my neighbor. And I took this picture to this lady and she said, that's my grandmother. Can I please have this photo? I said, please, it is for you. And then she was so warm, she said, no, no, you must have a meal. I was given a glass of buffalo milk, which was my back. 
and, <laughs> but uh, then they showed us how their culture actually works and what uh, things that they do. Like when, when a guy wants to marry a Toda girl, he has to pick up a big rock, a round rock, put it on his back and try to take it and lift it up. Uh, so this was demonstrated for me by this lady's uh, husband and she said he did it much better <laughs> Next, please. Uh, I also traveled a lot around many parts of India where there are still people who are pastoralists. And this is changing extremely rapidly because landscapes are changing so fast. The grasslands are disappearing across India and this is something which is just terrible. They are mismanaged. Most foresters still plant them with trees where actually you need grass. And this whole thinking is now just about changing. Uh, this uh, picture must have been taken. Sumanth had a lot of pictures from Rajasthan, which I don't have so many of. But the Maharashtra uh, people who are, who are pastoralists move hundreds of miles every year across the Western Ghats to grasslands in the, in the coastal plain and come back. And their linkage is very strong to my life. So, for example, <clears throat> the wolves from their native plateau area will travel with the flock for, for several, several meters, uh, kilometers, just to keep up ahead of the flock. So actually the wolves sometimes are seen there before the thunder arrive. And uh, it's a very interesting phenomenon, so how this has been happening. Only thing is now the Ganga has started walking on the road, so that's disappearing of settlement. Next, please. The whole these fisher folk communities that I visited across to both the western and eastern coast showed me how intimately, intimately they understood the sea. Uh, there was one fisher folk, uh, fisher farm, fisherman in uh, Chennai who told me how he could recognize where the fish are by the color of the sea. Now, that's something unique because today you need the Doppler to do it. But uh, they have these beautiful methods of doing this. And all of them told, uh, told us about the very rapid depletion of fish stocks, both on the western and the eastern coast. So currently, we are trying to, with Tata Chemicals and Mitapur, set up a coastal and marine ecology thing to gather data, to understand fishing techniques, and to try to find a way where that kind of fishermen can still survive, where you get so many trawlers down. Next, please. Well, <clears throat> these are absolutely unique photographs of, and Subhan Bhungar has hundreds of these pictures of tribal folk which you don't see this way anymore. So this is gone. Once these pictures are, would be gone, they would have gone. And today I've got scanned all these pictures because they are so very rare. And when I showed them in Nagaland, they were so thrilled with these pictures. They said, yeah, yeah, this paper like this. And then one of them said, <coughs> this guy, he's got two skulls. You know what sort of skull? Ah. Next, please. <coughs> this is my friend, Jivya. Uh, Jivya died only a few months ago. And <coughs> that is the last painting that he has done on a wall before he passed away for his granddaughter's uh, uh, wedding ceremony. Uh, that's Sunil, my friend from here. <coughs> was, uh, today I asked him, I said, uh, we, I'm coming to Bhopal, can you come? He said, sir, a full day lagega I said, no, don't come. <laughs> but uh, Sunil now, he wanders around all over the place, he's on wanderer. <coughs> So the first time when I got his pictures to be sold, he was actually selling them at some 50, 60 rupees in those days. Now, of course, he's, he knows that he can charge more for his pictures. But the first set of pictures which I sold to him, I said, Sudhi, put by some way, I can't get He said, no, my little brother is going to be married. So these are the things which have really talked to me about the people of this earth. How wonderful they are. These paintings are printed on t-shirts and sold in London. <laughs> not not so <laughs> Not so <laughs> Next. The Foundation is doing that. Not so 
Uh, these uh, bison on Marias, and I want to say how unfortunate this is. I've been to Maria uh, ceremonial dances where they are dressed in the normal way that they are not in this kind of costume. I've been to a Santal gathering from five or six village, villages in Chakran, where there were about roughly 2,000 people. There was this huge ring of people who would come and dance, move back, sit outside, come back again. And this ebb and flow of people there throughout two hours of that evening was something that I can never forget. Of course, on the other side, there was a cockfight going on. So no uh, Next, please. These two ladies are Vishnais from Rajasthan. And uh, when I went to Buddha and uh, tried to see photograph, to take pictures of Blackbird and Chikara, there was a farmer who came in his tractor. And he said, he said, Tarkangana. And I said, no, I want to take pictures of these animals because I use it for my teaching. So he said, no, no, you sit. I will show them to you very close from my tractor. So I got onto his tractor and then he took me to his house, introduced me to his, the two ladies in his house and said, you can't go away without a meal because you are doing God's work the way you do it. This is some years back. <clears throat> but this was something which was which has been a very intimate memory for my for me. Next, please. <coughs> the book that I've done on changing landscapes is really because there is no other common people's book for the cultural landscapes of India. So a lot of the things that I've written in that are quite new. Uh, many of them have not been written about before. There's a lot about the cultural landscape of Europe and the cultural landscape of America, and it comes in very different ways. But this cultural landscape, which means farming methodologies, um, animal husbandry methodologies, methodologies where people use non-timber uh, non forest report resources, are so very different in, the, in our country, and so varied that we need to document it now. We keep talking about wildlife, becoming, disappearing, and uh, extinction, and so on. But these cultural behavioral patterns are disappearing faster than the wildlife. And we have done very little to maintain this. One of my concerns is how do we maintain the originality of their artwork, of their bronze work, of their cast iron work from this area. And these are things which I think we need to look at and see what we can do with this. But what my book ends up is Something which was then and something which is now, this is on the outskirts of my own city of Pune, which is growing so very rapidly. And how land use change actually triggers and how it happens. What are the drivers? So my book is, uh, is a sort of a reflection on what I have seen. I'm a very old man, so I've seen it for a long time. And uh, this is what the second book really talks about, is the change in landscapes that we have seen over time. So this is, uh, very quickly, the biogeographic zones that Rogers and Pawar developed, on which I put the agriculture map. Next, please. Next, please. Uh, so you can see how very typically the agriculture matches very closely to the biogeography, which is modern science. Next. And that is the tribal uh, map, which is forest tribals and the grassland tribals, which are distributed very closely to forest and grassland. Next, please. Just a few to show you then and now. Suman's picture of an owl tribal girl taking water from a bamboo pipe. That's the typical way in which they do their, their agriculture through bamboo pipes, water to bamboo pipes. And that girl took me up on the hill to show me her, uh, her small turbine, which gives her electricity for her tea shop down below. So this is the change that you can expect. Next, please. Similarly, here's Suman's picture of this Warwick tribal. Today, of course, he's a showman. Uh, this, that's the Hornbill Festival. But you can see the gesture is still the same. The intent is different. Next. I, I believe this is a remarkable pair of pictures. 
you see these gold girls somewhere here. We don't know exactly where. Looking in awe at Suman's picture of machines, sewing machines. And today, in a similar village, I have photographed this girl actually sewing. This is again change, and this is what we want to see happen. Next thing. Uh, I got very fascinated with coastal landscapes, which is why I'm helping setting up the Center for Coastal and Marine Ecology. Because uh, we don't, uh, I'm a Parsi and I love to eat fish and meat, so <laughs> this uh, is something which is very sad for me personally also. That in the near future, I mean, I will not be able to afford to eat fish. But we need to understand how to make fishing more and more sustainable. And uh, today I've got four or five of my students working on this in different parts of uh, coastal India. Next. But this is a lovely story. This is a story of a small sacred group which has disappeared. It's gone under a new dam, unfortunately. It was a beautiful sacred group with enormously large trees. And this was a mother holy priest there. And uh, what fascinated me was that people told me that he tells that he tells a lot of stories. So when I went there for listening to his stories, he was doing this ceremony, uh, which is that he takes a drop of water and he makes two trickles there, two trickles of drops of water, and then he puts two grains of wheat in those two trickles. And then you ask him a question. And if the right one falls first with some extension, right, then you can do something or do X thing. If the left one falls, you cannot. So the two questions that I heard there from the villagers was one fellow saying, You know, I will get my doctor married. Starting with you. And he said, We put it at mother. Uh, should I do it in my own village or the neighboring village? And this thing said, Neighboring village, so you have to send his daughter away. Uh, the other fellow was more complex. He said, I've gone to court several times to the Kacheri there to try to find out whether my, this plot of land belongs to me or my nephew. And nobody tells me a decision on this. I've been waiting for 10 years and I'm becoming an old man. If I don't get it now, what will happen to this land? So he was not worried about whether his kids would get it or the nephew would get it. He was worried what will happen to my land. And uh, this fellow, of course, did this and said, give it off to your nephew. <laughs> so there are so many stories that uh, I came across over my travels in this country. It's such a diverse, it's such an incredible country. And uh, so much of it is going so fast. But there are lots we can do to maintain this. It's not that we need to say we can't do anything more. There's a lot to do. I have students uh, across the country now who are doing environmental science or wildlife biology who have come up with beautiful answers to questions like this. Next, please. <laughs> this is not a little story, if I have a few minutes. Uh, <clears throat> that picture is taken in 2000 in a sacred grove. That's the same sacred grove in 2015. So I've been going there for many, many years, from the 1990s actually. And uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful grove. You get hornbills and you get uh, uh, um, giant squirrels and you get a whole lot of forest birds. It's a brilliant little sacred grove in Mulshi Taluka where the Tatars have their dams. And uh, I often <coughs> sat and talked to that Pujari and uh, with various things. Like for instance, if you want a male child, you have to bring a little brass uh, cradle and put it in and things like that. But the temple looked like that. To my horror, this is what it has become. And several of those trees have actually had to be cut to make that temple. The interesting thing is, I asked him, hey, Bangal is doing Why did you do this? So he said, the panchayat got some money from government, and they were told to do something for the sacred grove. Now, people like you won't come in their cars and walk to the sacred grove. So we built the road and we built a temple <coughs> so that we get more. Now, see this. So the perception of this can actually be evolved through public awareness and education and say your growth is important. Because for them, his DT is important, not necessarily the growth. And so we need to change our values also in what uh, they actually want. This old man 
is a is no more. I used to go to him and take people to make him tell stories about how his sacred grove had come by what is known as Marathi Swayambhu, which means self thing. And he would tell these stories and I used to take people there because the grove was very beautiful also. His grove was his personal property. So I told him, Baba, he can be good of us. Don't sell your grove ever. And he said, ah, sir, well, I said, I said, hey. So when he come first to see you, he'll come with a stick walking like this. Then he said, to how did you save your growth? And you become straight. <laughs> and I knew him for many, many years. Recently, about a year ago, I took some friends there to his grow again. And his son was there. And uh, his son was telling this, this group of people that, you know, I have kept this growth because my father had given his word to this doctor son. <laughs> and then he hands me his mobile phone and said, Sahib, my children are in Pune study. Will you tell them also to save the group? <laughs> so, so you know, one minute step. So I did only one minute. I did only one more minute. Would I love to listen? Thanks, please. Quit this talk. Okay, this is the last one. Uh, Again, this is somewhere walking to a sacred grove where the pujari was taking me up to see a grove very, very far away, five kilometers up in the hills. And I saw this configuration on the ground and I thought it was one of their voodoo things. So I said, oh, I So he said, I said, sir, this is not for you. Here, look, just at it. It's not for you, not for you. I kept telling him, no, no, tell me what is this. I now thought, really, this is some voodoo business. So uh, he called a little boy who was there with his a cows and he said, uh, tell sir what is this? And he looked at me strangely and said, I must be dancing. He said, why this is my farmyard? He said, these are my cows, those are my mockers, that's the cow shed. And see this kid, very small kid, had collected all these things from, from the forest. He knew those cooker bits, he knew where to get them, he knew how to build this, he cleared up that place and put a fence around it. This is his game. Now imagine your children and my children or my grandson going into in Puna MG Road and buying a plastic farmyard. This is nature education. And a lot of this that we do today in my institute comes from these kinds of stories of nature education which we've had from children. So thank you very much. Wonderful, right? You made the silent pictures speak, narrate, and every picture had a story behind. So I'll just take one minute. Sorry, no no time for questions. You can discuss with him after after the session. I'll just, uh, last word will, will be from your side. I'll just make one or two observations. You know, see, I was just uh, flabbergasted with the uh, minute observation. On page 159 of uh, Living Bridges, the caption is, linking eyebrows of a tribal girl with culture. So they, they, they have the, the observation of the eyebrow of a tribal girl has been uh, so minutely observed. And uh, I was also very uh, fascinated about the urbanization chapter, you know, that uh, man-made, uh, I was just uh, telling Eric, man-made uh, uh, landscapes. So you have uh, now lots of urban forests, natural urban forests and and uh, artificial urban forest or plantation. So you'll be surprised in Bhopal, near Bhopal, we have one 1860 uh, hectare urban forest and which is natural urban forest. Probably that must be the largest in the uh, world because one I am uh, read about one Brazil uh, urban forest which is of course uh, man-made urban forest. So and uh, uh, lastly, actually, I'd like, like to have your uh, message. I can see a lot of uh, youth here, and I strongly feel that youth are the future custodian of the environment. So what will be your message to the youth for this sustainability of the environment? I, I think uh, the most critical thing to understand now is communication, education. Getting into the field. And I'd like to 
And, and since you asked me for a message, uh, just go to the last slide. So has he gone off? Okay. Uh, so I, I take a very uh, oh, you can show it to me in the book, yes. <laughs> Since you <laughs> suggested it. Read it, Why don't you read it? <laughs> well, I'm not a poet, but... Uh, Actually, I, I wanted to take the privilege of reading it. But it's not all all the uh, Well, it's, it, it's the last page of this book is uh, called The Unchanged in a Changing World. And it's, uh, it says, uh, humans will forever change. And as they change, they change the world. But as Earth changes, humans must change again. And so the cycle of change can never win. The wheel of time, however, has left the tribal folk behind. They travel through life, hoping for a better time. Many have lost what they love the most, their forests, mountains, rivers, and coasts. In, in their struggle to cross the river of life, they leave life to their ancient gods. The Varli to their Panskuti, the Katkari to their Vartel. Their undisturbed sacred groves have remained dear to them, though the wheel of time has moved away from them. In those groves, the lives of traditional folk stand still unchanged. Thank you very much.